Shall we, uh, shall we make a start? Uh, so, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to London HR Connection. And uh, for those of you who haven't met before, I'm Craig McCoy. I'm the chair of London HR Connection. Um, and uh, if you're here for the first time, welcome, and um, definitely hope you'll come again. Um, but we have um, a really interesting debate lined up this evening um, on the sub subjects of do HR directors make good non-executive directors? Um, so just a um, short introduction from me and then I'll introduce you to um, uh, my colleagues around the table. So um, I myself am an HR director and I'm also a NED, so I feel kind of reasonably qualified to be the chair of this particular debate. So. Um, uh, I uh, am currently the HR Director for Metropolitan, which is a large housing association. Um, I've got a career in HR of just over 30 years, so uh, it shows I'm getting old, if nothing else. <laughs> um, I'm also non exec Director for a business called Commercial Services Limited in Kent, which is a services business, everything from uh, school supplies to waste disposal, uh, ex-Kent County Council. Uh, I've been on the board about 18 months. Uh, I chair the Remco, I attend audit and the limited uh, board meetings. Um, so um, I'm in the situation where I'm juggling um, full-time HR director role, albeit interim, which is interesting, uh, uh, with uh, a NED role. Um, so um, I've got my own kind of particular experiences. I mean, part of, part of the um, topic tonight is why don't we see more HR directors as NEDs and um, maybe uh, I'm sure that will arise during our, our, our debate, given the, the subject matter expertise that HR directors have, uh, everything from obviously executive remuneration, perhaps more, more technical points, but also to uh, team facilitation, team dynamics, obviously very important around the board table. Uh, so why don't we see more HR directors as NEDs and um, hopefully that will emerge as the, as, the, as the debate goes on. Um, so if I can first of all introduce my colleagues, um, I'm going to start uh, with the ladies, with Wendy. Uh, so Wendy Cartwright um, is currently uh, at the University of East London where you're Director of Corporate Services. Um, really interesting uh, uh, role that she did um, uh, it could, you know, a, few, a few years ago now at the Olympic Development Authority getting ready for the Olympics which uh, must have been a fascinating role um, and um, uh, you've done a number of things you're not exec director at the MOD's Defence People and Training Board um, and uh, you've worked in financial services, energy and retail um, so uh, welcome uh, if I turn now to John John Wrighthouse um, Long career in financial services, uh, 25 years, Thanks. some, uh, <laughs> uh, some uh, great brands uh, nationwide, NatWest, Gyro Bank, um, and last few years at Clinton Cards and HomeServe, uh, but uh, you're currently also non-exec director of the Guide Dogs for the Blind. Uh, and finally on my right, uh, Derek Manuel. Uh, Derek I've known uh, a few years now actually, um, but uh, Derek has... Um, uh, a lot of early background in technology, um, having worked for businesses such as Hitachi, Symantec and Mysis. Um, so a range of cultures there as well, everything from Japanese to Canadians to Americans. At one point, uh, a Texas-Japan joint venture. Must have been really interesting, well, perhaps we'll hear a bit more about that. Um, uh, and uh, you were at Save the Children, when I, when I first met you as the HR director there. Um, and um, you're currently non-exec director of the Crown Prosecution Service, yeah. which must be uh, is that second term. Yeah, second yeah. term as uh, non-exec director of the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, so um, very pleased to say we've got you know a very senior panel here tonight. So I'm hoping we'll have uh, some good debate and some good questions coming forward. Um, so uh, first of all then, if I can ask each of the um, panellists to briefly introduce themselves. We've set the time limit of seven minutes um, <laughs> and I know that some of my colleagues will start shouting if you go over. So uh, <laughs> uh, Wendy, if we can start with yes, you please. Thank, thank you. Um, I ho I'm hoping my voice will hold up, but um, there's no microphones here, but it's a little bit uh, like that. So can you hear me at the back okay? Yeah, I've just got the normal cold that's going on, thank you. Um, give me a wave if you can't. Um, so you've already said that I've got a sort of multi-sector background, mixture of public and private sector in there. 
um, although latterly um, mostly public sector and we were just having a conversation earlier about how you can kind of get typecast depending on the sector and role that you're in and I think that kind of also plays to the way you can add value and, and particularly in your kind of non-exec director career but um, when we were speaking earlier Craig you got saying you know what would be helpful by way of introduction is how did you get to be a non-exec and I mm-hmm. I got to be a non-exec through um, uh, I'm, if I take two examples I'm a um, as um, Craig was saying, I'm uh, on the Defence People and Training Board, uh, which is an MOD board, and the uh, process for that, like most public appointments, is that you have to apply. <laughs> um, you know, there's no networking. There was a little bit of, um, you know, sort of in, in, initial sort of, um, sort of uh, bringing it to my attention. But then the, the process is properly advertised, and you go through a proper recruitment process for that. Uh, but in this case, actually, it was quite in, interesting, and maybe a slight departure from the way that the public sector can operate, because the lead non-exec director for the MOD is a, a chap called Jerry Grimstone, who is actually a financial services background being the chairman of Standard Life and he was approaching this in a way that was about building a talent pool of potential non-exec directors who could fill a number of roles on, on potentially an MOD board so that was a really interesting experience actually kind of the melding of the two cultures and Jerry has done quite a lot to um, sort of improve governance um, across the MOD various boards um, so but that was a proper application um, uh, sifting interview process and then um, on the basis that you had a certain sort of skill set that they might be interested in then when those roles came up there was an approach to say would you be interested in this and then meeting these people and so on so that was actually it was a really excellent process from the perspective of, 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 of an applicant and um, rigorous but um, but uh, but you know not um, not not difficult to navigate um, like some public sector application processes can be. The other role that I do is, as a, as a non-exec director is I'm on the advisory board of a very small organisation. So it's a it's a, an, an SME. It's a it's a business that looks at um, diversity. So it's called Global Diversity Practice. And I was approached um, to to join the board by the owner who I, I'd been a client of before. And um, so I joined the board of that, and now I chair that, and that's an advisory board, so very different from um, from the from the uh, MOD experience, and actually fascinating to have the difference between the. Well, you can imagine the breadth <laughs> across MO, uh, the MOD portfolio because that goes across the services as well, um, to um, and the, the you know the matters that you discuss very different from the kind of support and gui- advice and guidance that you give to a very small organisation that is got a global reach but is basically working with a group of associates trying to um, trying to grow their portfolio so that's um, and why did I become an, a, a non-exec director was <laughs> was another mm-hmm. question that you kind of posed I think for two reasons um, one because actually I think the, the that you learn by looking externally and you can bring that to your you know you grow as a as, a, as, a, as, a, as an HRD um, but and you can you can also bring that external experience into your organization so it is so there is a selfish reason and it, <laughs> you know, it looks good on the CV and so on and so on but also I think um, and this goes to the heart of the question, I do think that, that you can add value to organisations by bringing the skill set that you've gathered over a, uh, over a number of years. And I think those have been the kind of defining factors that have influenced me when I've chosen to go, you know, the, the, the two organisations two organisations that I've spoken about, I, I actually care a lot about what they do and I think I can add value to them and those are the kind of things that I'd say just to kind of open up um, conversation. Very good, thank you very much and uh, if I turn now therefore to John. Thanks Craig, nice to see everybody, hello. Um, I, I've been on the Guide Dogs board for about uh, uh, four years, I'm in my second my second term, so two, two terms of three years, and I've just been appointed as a, an independent non-exec for um, the Nationwide uh, Pension Fund, uh, which is a four and a half billion uh, fund, so that'll be entertaining, I'll start that in January. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll tell you, I guess, um, I'll let you in, in, into a, a conversation I had with my son this morning, because it's, it's Wednesday, so it's, uh, it's rugby day, mm-hmm. and um, uh, the last couple of months I've been trying to have Wednesday, Wednesdays off so I can go and watch him play, because it's, it's, it's not, well, whilst I can, it's nice to do that, and it's, and it's good for him. So I was in a car this morning, and, and he said, oh, I said, I won't be able to pick you up today, because I'm, I'm going to be in London, so I'll see you tomorrow. And he said, oh, what are you doing? So I said, oh, I'm, um, I'm having a conversation with some people about uh, what makes a good non-exec director. 
and, 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 he, and, he, and he looked at me and paused. And I think he, he's only nine, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> so he's, he's thinking, what's an exec director? And he said, uh, I said, what, what do you think an on exec director is? And he said, hmm, he paused. He looked out the window and came back and said, um, well, I suppose you've got to be good at sitting in a big chair, haven't you? <laughs> um, and, 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 and you probably have like a nice lunch, don't you, I suppose? And um, well, and you'll be quite good at this, because you talk a lot, don't you? So that, that's what non execs do. They talk, don't they? So I thought, well, he's probably, probably fairly that's, right. That's the job description. So um, if you're not an exec director, just ask my nine-year-old. He, he's, uh, he's already on, on side. But I thought, actually, some of his points were, were right, because it made me think this morning about my, um, my first board experience. And um, I, I remember before the board, and I was nervous as, as oops, nervous as something, um, my first board, not quite sure what to expect. And uh, I got a phone call from the company secretary to say, what was I going to drink? And I thought, well, I'll just have water. Well, well. He said, no, 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 what will you have for lunch? Um, so I thought, oh God, um, and so I had to choose from this wine menu what I was going to have, um, and I thought, I'm not going to be drinking, that's the last thing I'm going to be doing. Um, but then I was looking back, and actually uh, it was to Brian Nicholson said, uh, who was the uh, uh, chairman of the Financial Reporting Council, said that the days of turning up for, a, for a, an hour board meeting and a good lunch are gone. Um, shame. An ab absolute shame, I thought. Um, <laughs> um, but he's absolutely right, um, and for those of you that are uh, boring enough, there's actually... Um, in October, there was a um, the FRC published uh, succession planning, um, and what's what's if you get a chance, by the way, read it. If not, I can send you the Deloitte summary version, which is a page which is nice and easy to read. Um, uh, what's going to be happening now is that boards are going to be required to start talking about succession and start publishing their information in their own important accounts about succession, um, because what we're finding is is that. Um, that's probably one of the biggest risk factors to an organisation, uh, either in the board level or exec level, uh, and we should be, or investors should be far more aware of, of those things. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, HR people are fantastic, uh, and that's, that's our, our job, isn't it? Looking at talent and growing talent in organisations. So I think, uh, and the reason why I, I was very happy to, to, to come along is that I genuinely believe, genuinely believe, that this is the moment for HR people if we seize it well. Um, and just let me explain why I, why I believe that uh, to be the case. So I want to give you, perhaps give you a practical um, sort of view of, of, uh, of um, being a non-exec director and my experience, because I've been also involved on the other side of the table, uh, appointing non-exec directors as well, either for uh, the PLC boards uh, that I've been part of uh, or, in fact, the charity boards I've been part of. So I can give you, I guess, an insight into what chairmen tell me they want and perhaps what they end up with. Uh, so let me just give you a, give you a little sense, if I, if I can, in my seven minutes. Uh, um, so so um, what's driving this? I think expectations of boards are changing. Um, it seriously now is, is about um, adding some value to the board. Boards are also getting slimmer. Um, so there are some real competing issues, particularly in my experience is, is, is predominantly FS, but not, not, not entirely, uh, is that FS boards are getting slimmer because they, um, it's hard to get decisions made when you have big... Uh, big boards, uh, first of all, and the F, uh, FCA, the regulator, is requiring people to have some real unique skill and they have to be approved people. So fewer people are getting onto these boards and chairmen want smaller boards. So if you're going to be on that board, you seriously have to contribute something worthwhile. Um, you can't be a passenger um, and that's what I'm finding uh, from current appointments. And I think what, what, what we find in FS finds its way across into other PLCs. To other sectors. So if I look at things like uh, uh, bonus arrangements, uh, you know, it, we're, we're very keen or we're very keen to bash bankers because of these enormous bonuses that we've been uh, uh, attracting. Uh, and then I think called the CR CRD3, the Capital Requirements Directive 3, which is a European uh, legislation, came in requiring things like clawback, deferral, that all things now we're seeing come into, into uh, non-FS regulated businesses. And I mention those particularly because, again, that's in our ballpark. We understand remuneration really well. Uh, we've done remuneration for a long time. And the boards are looking for people that can understand REM and are able to contribute in, 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 in that sense. So, so what's the purpose? Let me just step back for a second. So what, what is the purpose of, of, of an ED? Why, why do organisations have them? Well, apart from satisfying company law, um, there are probably five key themes that, that they want NEDs to look at. Uh, strategy. Uh, performance, uh, the resources of the organisation, uh, making key, key appointments, both at exec level and at board level, and uh, standards of conduct. They're probably the five, if, if I was going to try and whittle, them, whittle the issues down to those five things. You may call them something slightly different, but I suspect that's probably, they're probably reasonable headings to, uh, uh, to go for. So, so when I'm talking to chairman about uh, selection uh, processes, uh, I, I think there are six themes that emerge 
uh, for my conversations with them. Uh, they're looking for people with breadth of experience, uh, different experiences to bring to the board and to complement the board. So often perhaps out of sector where they can draw parallels uh, to that organisation. Um, they want people with specialist knowledge and that's um, the bit I'll cling on to for a minute because I think that's where we will start to play. Um, in FS, um, that's played out in terms of people with lots of risk and lots of compliance experience. But with things like CRD3 and CRD4, i.e. remuneration issues, I think that's where HR people will start to play. Um, there is an issue around personal qualities. Um, and the biggest learning I've had of being a, a non-exec, and the, probably the hardest, is to shut up. Um, which is hard for me, believe me. Um, <laughs> and, and to want to grab hold of the agenda. And when you're sat in that meeting and you're listening to a fellow HR director talk bollocks, I mean, <laughs> talk, talk, talk about what they're talking about, you want to be able to, to say, just give it to me, I'll sort it out. You can't. Um, and you're not thanked for trying to grab the agenda. Um, so, so, so personal qualities around being able to influence, uh, being able to listen well, and be able to bring people with you. And I find a lot of business, by the way, is done outside the board, particularly with the non-exec directors. What happens at the board meeting is just a play. Um, the real work takes place outside. And again, I think that's where HR people play really, really well, because that's how we do business too, is that we will, we will do subtle influencing, we'll talk to people. The decisions will hopefully be lined up before you get to make the decision. And that's how, the, in my experience, the boards are working. Um, the biggest thing the regulators are certainly looking for is independence of, of management, is that the non-execs are prepared to call out things um, and not in the pocket of management. And I guess if I look, and I'm sorry if I mention the organisation that you may have worked for, but if I look at some of the organisations that have failed in this respect, RBS, too big to fail, they failed. Uh, the chairman, I don't know if anyone saw a spectacular AGM where uh, one of the analysts, I think it was actually uh, Robert Peston, I think, asked him, um, did they have any exposure to um, some particular type of debt in the States? And he said, no, no, no. Little did he know, that actually, that was their biggest downfall, is that they, 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 they bought a, an organisation uh, in the States that was riddled with this debt, and he had no idea. So he was too distant from, from the, the working of the organisation, and probably, I suspect, too frightened of the chief exec of RBS. Um, you have Halifax that failed, you have Enron that failed, and if I'm looking at something perhaps a bit smaller, Kids Company that failed. And in Kids Company, by the way, uh, which I think is really interesting, is as much as we may love or hate um, Camilla, she has passion, um, but she may perhaps have led the organisation in the wrong direction. She's not legally responsible for it. So unless she's stolen any cash, and I'm not suggesting by it for any second that she has, she has no legal responsibility in a charity. The people that will carry that responsibility are the trustees and non-execs. So when I'm sat in the guide dogs board and I'm listening to... Um, to my exec colleagues telling me stuff, I want to feel really confident that actually I'm getting the right information because I'm the one who mm. can make a tough decision that they're going to come after. They'll all walk away to their next, their next organisation. Mm. So independence of mine is, is a real feature, and particularly the regulator. And the regulator, uh, if anyone, uh, I'm talking FS because that's what I'm most familiar with. When you're looking to make an appointment, you normally um, speak to the regulator um, for, a, for a view and they will red flag someone if they don't think they're very good. I'll, 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 I'm, I'm, looking, I'm, I'm looking at nodding out. You're going to get But I'll, I'll come on to some practical points about how to get into uh, a non-exec role uh, in the q and Absolutely, later. yeah. yeah no, and thank you. Lots of food for thought there. We'll come back to many of those things. So uh, last but not least, Derek. Um, thank you. So I'm no longer uh, an HR director, but I am currently a non-exec. I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, so the question and uh, it wouldn't be much of a debate if everyone said the same thing. So I'm probably going to go the other way and say, there's not a lot of data at the moment, is there? I mean, you're looking at some people who've made really good um, progress in, in, the, in that. But it's not common. It's not common to find HR directors on a board, um, certainly not non-execs on a board. So. Can you really judge when you don't have a lot of data? I asked all the, since Craig invited me, I asked all the chief execs I know. I said, I'm speaking at this thing, what would you say? And I often got a bit of a grimace. Um, <laughs> and they all, oh, I don't know. And then they realised they were talking to somebody who used to be an HR director and they modified what they were going to say. But Henley wrote something recently that said, why chief execs don't like HR. Henley wrote that, the Centre for HR Excellence. So there's something in there's something in the question um, about uh, do we make great HR uh, do we make great non-execs? I think those who are given the chance are the right kind of person. Um, I, I think undoubtedly, and I agree with everything all my colleagues have said on that. Um, 
So perhaps if I give a few reasons why maybe there are so few people represented uh, as non-execs. Um, if you're a, an exec or a non-exec, your job is everything to do with the whole of the business. It's, uh, you, you know, you can't, you're not there to specialise. You may have got there because of your special skills, but you're not there to specialise. Um, so you've got a collective responsibility. What's the distinct purpose of a non-exec? Sometimes, uh, particularly, in, we were talking before, particularly in financial services, non-execs are a tier above the exec board, which may not be called the exec board. Um, so there's possibly some governance, certainly the independence that a non-exec brings uh, by not being an employee of the organisation fundamentally. If you look at the way our professional education runs as HR people, my view is it's quite narrow. I was looking at the curriculum last night. I know I'm at a CIPD event, but I'm sure constructive criticism is welcome. Um, I was looking at the, the curriculum last night. It is purely HR. 58% of the FTSE 100 boards in the chair or the chief exec or the CFO, 58% have got chartered accountants. Mm -hmm. Look at the chartered accounting curriculum, it's a lot broader. Now, I'm not saying those are the only comparisons, but I think a broader education and a broader set of experiences for HR folk would, would prepare us better uh, and give us more uh, more chance to redress some of that inequity, well, yeah, inequity um, imbalance and get uh, people management skills onto boards uh, in the organisation. Um, it might be interesting to talk about what current gaps of boards, at least the boards I know, what, what are boards focusing on. Um, it's, not, it's not the absence of HR people, sadly. Um, the FT did an article last month, 1% of non-execs in Europe top companies uh, have proven, uh, top uh, 100 companies have proven digital skills, it's 8% in the US, so 8 times better because they only need 8% digital skills. Boards know that they need to get digital skills on their boards and they, they're probably shrinking their boards but they still need to get digital skills on there somewhere. Um, the gender imbalance. 18% of women, according to Russell Reynolds, 18% uh, non-execs globally are women. Um, do the maths as to who make up the rest. Um, so those, for an intelligent board, those are probably the things the boards are working on. Um, and, and absence of HR skills hasn't yet, I, in my view, anyway, got to the, the, uh, the board recruitment agenda. So um, I've got some thoughts uh, also about you know, what we could do to make ourselves more visible, make ourselves more um, <coughs> attractive to companies, um, things you could do within your own company if you would like to move uh, into a board type position, and perhaps we can bring that out in Q&A. Uh, but finally, a uh, positive thought, if, if a company is even halfway thinking about having a non-exec with HR skills, Unless they're trying to get HR onto the board on the cheap, you know, they must have some well-developed thoughts about people, and, and I would hope they've got some well-developed HR presence up to and including an executive level. And that tells you a lot about what they would want the non-exec with HR background to do, um, and hopefully not to sit there doing operational things. So. Um, Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe we've reached the same sort of conclusion. It would be a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced there's a lot of evidence out there that boards have bought into it. Very good. Thanks, Derek. So in a moment, I'm going to open up the floor for some question and answers. Um, but just, just to start the ball rolling, um, HR directors as NEDs, um, in your experience, uh, do you find it's largely limited to Remco and Nominations Committee? or? Are you, do you find that you're um, expected to contribute more strategically and more commercially to discussions around the table at the board meetings? So, yeah. Uh, um, I, think, I think the reason, so in my experience, the reason why they were interested is for my REM experience. Um, but that morphed very quickly in terms of um, uh, adding value in a much broader sense. So, 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 no, I don't expect to get questions in, in the board meeting. Remco, Remco yes. 
Um, and Remco probably is a single show, so you're, you're often uh, asking all the questions. But the main board itself, uh, no, I think it's, it's in a much broader business capacity. And, and you're I, able to contribute more, more, um, more broadly to strategy? Uh, and well, at first, at first <coughs> part, I was a bit shy, um, which is unusual. <laughs> I was a bit shy. Um, and then suddenly realised that actually there were very few people around the board table, actually, that were able to take a very broad view. And suddenly realising, actually, I do have a broad view. Uh, so once I'd, once I'd realised that, um, uh, that others actually weren't any better, and suddenly you find yourself thinking, yeah, there's a lot here I can contribute to. Yeah. Um, and particularly, i give you some core examples, things like ability to ask questions, uh, ability to ask the, the second or third question, and you suddenly realise that the person is not, not quite on target. Uh, and HR people are great at being able to sort of get around those, that first response. Um, so suddenly I found myself thinking, yeah, I, I can do this. Um, and then your other colleagues then start looking at you to ask the question, go on, ask the question. Mm -hmm. um, Growing confidence. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wendy, any thoughts from you on yeah, that? Yeah, I've um, kind of, so, so the, the board that I was offered to join and chose to join at the, at the Ministry of Defence, the kind of clues in the title, it's the Defence People and Training Board. So it's that mm. I'm there because mm. I'm an HR person from outside mm. of the sector. Mm. And, but the breadth of stuff that they look at is absolutely extraordinary. Mm. But we focus on things like engagement, things like remuneration issues, etc., etc. And interestingly, actually, about how things fit together across the whole portfolio, you know, um, there because it, you know the, there's representation from the different services and there's representation from from the um, from the other um, bodies that have um, top level boards. You know, so that is so it's kind of the army, navy, etc. But also defence equipment and support, business services, and so on. So, so it's that thing about stitching together the bigger picture. I think, but but the, that board is about people, and it's about the people agenda. So that's a bit different. But it, but again, interestingly, when I was um, talking to the MOD about which board might um, might be interested in me and I might be interested in. The other one that they were talking to me about was the Defence Equipment and Support Board, which was being set up as an arm's length body and was being set up in a way that would allow it to uh, kind of trade and deal with, you know, in the same way as the... Um, as the Olympic Delivery Authority that I used to work for had, was a non-departmental public body but had a really strong interface with the private sector. So had I gone and joined that board, um, they would have been as interested in my knowledge of how public and private sector interface and on program management, yeah. if you see what I mean. Yeah. So it's again about, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, so yeah. it, it, I think it's about... Um, uh, applying your knowledge within the context. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the attraction on the Defence People and Training Board was the breadth of it because mm -hmm. it's massive and really interesting and complicated. Um, but I, but I, I, but I also, I mean, and I don't sit on any Remco's or non yeah. committees. Mm -hmm. But um, there's an interesting article um, that HR Magazine uh, ran, and I can send the link if you want to send it out. But mm -hmm. but uh, in talking to um, uh, headhunters and just saying why are why are, are you know, are more HR directors taking up Ned roles? Then speaking to a couple of headhunters from um, Egon Zender, Corn Ferry, they're saying it's like a trickle through, but there's more interest now in, in, in boards, in, in looking at HR people. Some of that is because of the Remco experience, right, right. <laughs> and it's some of that yeah. is about the kind of culture issues that you were alluding to, John, in the beginning about. Um, you know, if you get the culture issues right and the kind of um, mm -hmm. the risk, you know, management of risk mm -hmm. and so on, and I think a good HR person can have an, make enormous contributions on some of those. Mm -hmm. Derek, thank you, Derek. In, uh, yeah, I'd agree. Um, and within um, civil service, mm -hmm. there is a real keenness to have uh, ha have what you're saying, really, mm -hmm. HR skills. Uh, HR plus, I think, um, at a departmental board level. So uh, I was, um, it was interesting when I joined CPS, which is uh, one of the smaller government departments, um, I, uh, part of the process, I was talking with the former Director of Public Prosecutions, Kia Starmer, and most of the conversation wasn't about the obvious attraction if you're looking for somebody with an HR background, because I had an HR background. But we were talking about public interest, mm. and and that was the interest for me, not another opportunity to display my HR skills, but actually an opportunity not to, but to be involved in an organisation that works in the public interest. Mm. And I'd just come from Save the Children, I'd been on the board there, and that works to a degree 
for you know certainly set of public interest. Um, I then went on a hospital board, and that's another dimension for me anyway of public interest. Um, so for me, I, you know, I was kind of it wasn't necessarily the reason to recruit me, but there was a logic for me, um, and then an interest outside the subject of HR. So I've come today from chairing a governance committee. And I think that's quite a natural mm. thing for certain HR skills to move into. If you you know if you if you think you know how organisations work or should work, um, if you've got views around ethics of organisations, um, the way organisations structure themselves, um, and just good general business conduct, mm -hmm. a governance committee is yeah. quite an interesting a natural route to to move into. Yeah, and gov and, and typically mm -hmm. government departments have got two committees: an audit and the governance committee, and they're both chaired by non-execs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's the, the kind of, from a civil service point of view anyway, the value that the civil service puts on independent, non-exec uh, contribution. Good. Thank you, Derek. Let me uh, pause there and uh, open up uh, the floor to questions. You know, a question here. Hi. Uh, I suppose when I think of our opportunity as HR directors in the non-exec space, I, I think about the research which talks about, you know, as an organisation, are you going through a transformation or planning to go through a transformation or change in the next two to three years? And that always gets like a 90 or 85% sort of response rate. So I always would have thought, given our core skills in that space, that's an opportunity. Do, do you agree or, or not? Because that's where I would have thought, you know, you, you can teach only so much, but the experience combined with broader HR knowledge puts us in a pretty uh, in a good position. I, 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 w I would, but I think that's such an important thing. Why would you want it to be a part timer? Why, you know, because a non exec is well, often somebody who doesn't turn up every day, yeah. you know, is not required to turn up every day, yeah. um, and doesn't engage in operational things so much, yeah. if at all. Yeah, Where, whereas if you're an exec executive, so basically yeah. an employee at the HR director, yeah, I mean, that should be your agenda. And the board should hold you accountable for that. You know, the question is, would you want a kind of shadow non-exec? Hmm. Yeah, I think my, my, my experience in that, in, in that specific issue around you know, bringing transformation skills, uh, I, I think perhaps a pre-IPO board or a PE-backed board might well want somebody. But, but it's, it's an unusual non-exec because they're probably wanting you to come in and actually be more directive, which is unusual for non-exec, but they're, they're trying to fill a gap. Uh, and it's mainly pre-IPO people that, that, that really want it. Um, a, a normalised board, if I can call it that, um, I think it would be less likely they'd want somebody in with just transformation skill because so the job would be to be able to, to hold them to account and to question them uh, rather than say, look, you know, I, I know how to do this, let me well, do it. So if I reflect on the, the board that we had at the Olympic Delivery Authority, it was actually quite a big board and our chairman resisted attempts um, at the time to slim it down. And, and when we were looking at the composition of that, even when... Um, you know, um, when we were looking at the kind of second term appointments, because each of those board members had been appointed because of the, and it, we kind of called it a stakeholder board. It was a non-exec mm -hmm. director mm -hmm. board, but each of those individuals on there was incredibly credible in their own, mm -hmm. you know, area. So, um, so we had a representative on the board that had, you know, very um, yeah, high level credibility with the design community. We had somebody on the board that had that actually was a trade unionist. We had, you know, so that actually um, those individuals were sitting on the board with a collective voice, but you knew that there was somebody on there that had that deep expertise and could drill down into yeah. it. So I, I, I agree with you, I think, in terms of your question. If, if, a, if an organisation is going through business change or if an organisation is looking at its values or if an organisation is doing a number of those things, and then when you look at the, the, the kind of, yes, yes, the Henley thing said, you know, chief executives, how do they, you know, what do they think about HR? Periodically we get those. But when you when you see the surveys, the periodic surveys of chief executives and the things that worry them, it's around the people agenda. It's around succession planning. It's around yeah. culture change. It's around those issues. So it's about talent, as we were saying. You know, it's about and and that there should be somebody on the board who's got an eye to that. Mm. And that person, and you know, and, and you know, <laughs> how many organisations have, have have invested in IT? enormous amounts of money in IT kind of missing the point because it's about the people that have got to do that and I just think we've got to own this agenda a bit more mm -hmm. and stand up you know stand up for it and just go you know we know about this stuff mm -hmm. and be the first person to ask the question about the people 
stuff rather than you know say oh we're very commercial and we do you know I think for me and we were talking in the bar earlier that thing about the finance director so a good finance director is incredibly commercial and sees a breadth across the organization a bad finance director is a bean counter who just kind of does that (laughs) stuff and a good HR director is somebody who can do all of that breadth and it is all about that kind of deep organizational knowledge so Yes, for me on that one. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so um, Mick, I hope that answers your question. Kind of um, yes and no, because uh, obviously it plays <laughs> it plays it plays to the role of non-exec versus exec and um, uh, other roles they play in change management. So uh, another question. So, so picking up that, that that point, it seems to me that if you're an ambitious HR director, you need to make absolutely certain that you get onto your board and that you start to operate wider than your own portfolio before you are ready to become a non exec yeah. It seems that, yeah. that that's really important, that you, that you get onto your board first as an executive, um, and then you start to operate wider yeah. than, than your own That's probably true. Oh, I absolutely agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, uh, I'd, I'd flip it around the other way. I'd try to work a bit wider first, and that, that might make you a more attractive person for a board. <coughs> Just my preference, but mm-hmm. like, if if you can show that you lead projects within the organisation that aren't HR projects, um, you know you can do things um, that are across a wider spectrum. Don't wait till you get on the board to start doing. It. I, 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 I would add to the flavour of this by saying it's, and this is I think true of anyone trying to become a non-exec, so not just HR guys, is it's it's very difficult to get your first. Once you get your first, suddenly and then perhaps recruitment agencies are the worst for this, is that they, they like to box you into a thing. Yeah. So if you haven't got one, you're not interested. If you've Cat got 22. one, suddenly everybody wants you. Uh, and it's, it's a bit like buses, isn't it? Suddenly they all turn up at the same time. And you, of course, you can't do them, can you? Because you've only got so much time in your diary to be able to, to do it. Um, but the biggest, to pick up on, perhaps on, on Derek's point, is, is uh, your, your best person to help you get one is probably your chairman. Um, because the chairman will be, or other non-exec directors, and if they see you operating in that broad space already, and of course by you know, attending board uh, and doing what you're doing well, suddenly they will start recommending you, and, and that's it's a horrible way to say it because it's, it's, it's the perhaps it's the old boys club type thing, but that's how it works. Um, so you need to get sponsors, and they're often the chairman or other non-execs. <coughs> Um, John, perhaps yeah. you can... Uh, Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Um, well, I've enjoyed listening to all the panellists this evening, and one of the reasons I came mm. is because I'm a uh, trustee of, of St Mungo's, and I was very interested to hear um, about your experiences, because uh, you know, I've been a trustee for nearly five years, and I'm, I still feel like in a, in a learning mode. Yeah. And I think, uh, John, you've just made a very good point about um, you know, being equipped to be a non-exec director, because I think most people, regardless of their background, that come onto the boards generally don't know what's expected of them. When I came onto the board, having what well, at the time I was a chief executive of the organisation, I wanted to run it. And the chief, yes. and the, the chief executive of um, Broadway, as it was, then took me to one side and said, Look, John, you're here to um, scrutinise, yeah. help the strategy and support. And then I thought, I'd be going to find the And it, it took me a good few years to actually get to grips with what I was really there to do. But I suppose my question to, to the panel is really about um, at board meetings, how much is, apart from REM, how much is actually the, 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 the key HR issues that you're talking about? Because in my experience, 80% of the um, board meetings are to do with finance, risk, and in our case, sort of housing, stock, and uh, asset registers. And yet, we've just gone through a huge merger. Um, the, 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 you know, the really key issues in the organisation are to do with change. We're trying to, to to change the way that we reward people. We're looking at you know creating a new culture, introducing you know, a more of a performance culture in the organisation, mm. and the concepts of value for money, which I, I guess Derek you're probably you know, very familiar with from your background as well. So just just interesting to know how much of your from your experience of board meetings is actually HR. Hmm. Good question. Anyone like to? Yeah. So, um, speaking as I said, the, the board that I sit on, the Defence People and Training Board, is all about defence people and training. Um, but in in terms of my experience of, of operating with and supporting other boards, when I've 
when I've been an exec director working with them, I, I would say that um, even the good ones tend to get focused on the kind of task and operational stuff a bit too much. And the, um, um, the, um, this kind of overview about what's the board purpose, um, are they spending their time on the right things, you know, you get that, you can do, um, you may well have already done this, but um, if you do a periodic board review of that, that is, you know, a really good deep dive with in the members individually, and are they spending their time on the right issues, what are the, you know, is, is, the, is, the, is the board membership correct, are they, et cetera, et cetera, is, 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 a, is a really good way of just kind of the board checking its own <laughs> effectiveness, because it sounds to me like if as a board member you're not thinking that you're spending your time on the right issues, you're perfectly placed to, <laughs> to kind of raise that, and, and, and um, you know, where's the space for the board to have that, that conversation. Also, in my experience as well with other boards, and certainly as a kind of um, a, a defence people and training board member, I've been absolutely blown away with the effort that um, the MOD has put into getting us up to speed as NEDs. So we've been around the business, we've been given briefings and so on and so on. So we'll have operational readiness meet briefings, we'll get together with NEDs from other boards and so on. So it's not for lack of effort that they try and get you mm. kind of an, enough, um, you know, uh, knowing about what's going on a, 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 across the business. Um, but um, yeah, I suppose that's all I can add to that. Mm. I suppose part of the answer is it's process as well as content. So yeah. it's kind of like it's not necessarily it's HR topics or people topics being discussed. It's how you can contribute to the effective running of, of the yeah. meeting and yeah. the team dynamics and facilitation of the meeting yeah. uh, is often yeah. a role that HR directors step into. Yeah. Um, so can I add something for John? Um, it must depend on the kind of organisation, obviously. But you know, in, in the ones that I've worked in, so hospital board. Um, you know, there, obviously there are some processes and some techniques and some machinery, but it is mostly about people mm. working with mm. other people. Um, yeah. Yeah, service delivery organisations like Crown Prosecution mm. Service or Save the Children or you know other organisations I've worked in. It's not these aren't manufacturing organisations, so you don't necessarily have a conversation badged as people. You're talking about quality, mm. but that's about how people work in a service organisation, mm. how they how they work, how they're organised. Or risk, you know, when you're operating in insecure countries, I mean, uh, and you're not manufacturing something, you're talking about the risk to people, mm. or your risk, or your reputational risk. So, I, I think, I think the the subtle point there is, does the board realise they're talking about people? Because mm. they are talking about people issues, mm. and maybe if there were uh, the right kind of HR presence there, um, you know, you wouldn't need to be badging it as this is another people discussion. You know, everyone would be comfortable having a discussion about yeah. risk yeah. and how, looking at the way people work, you could minimise or mitigate some of the risk, for example. So, but I guess if you're high, highly into production as an organisation, um, you know, your conversations might be more about techniques and um, I, I, things like that. I'm, I'm, my task, if, if I can, John, um, I've just done a... Um, uh, an FCA enforcement recovery role. Um, so, so, the, so the home service was the business I, I, I was with as HR director. And uh, it, for those that aren't in financial services, it sounds bizarre, but the regulator can stop you selling. Um, and it puts you into this nice thing called enforcement, um, which basically means you're going to get fined a big number, uh, but we'll tell you later. Uh, but part of the process is that they stop you selling. So most businesses can't survive for very long if they're not selling. Um, and there were three things that uh, I was required to do. Um, sort, out, sort out REM. Uh, sort out what's called training and competence, and sort out culture. And culture was a big bag. Um, and I've so, so this is I'm talking now from a um, exec being on the board as opposed to a non-exec. Um, but I found at the board we'd have all the usual stuff about finance, which took about sort of half an hour. We then have a conversation about risk, which probably took about three quarters to an hour. And then the rest of the meeting was about culture. And guess who was there talking about that? Me. Um, and that was that. And most non-execs got most excited about the cultural mm. issues. Um, probably most people fell asleep at the finance bit because it's it's fairly it's fairly straightforward, isn't it? You know, you know your cash flows there, fine, and then the rest of it's all ticking along. So there's not a lot really to, to challenge. Um, but everyone wakes up when it comes to the culture. Um, so okay, I wasn't as a non I wasn't a non-exec in that in that capacity. But all by far the majority of the board, each and every board, every month, was about culture. Uh, and, and how we're going to make this all a, a customer-centric organisation, and I was leading that debate. And the thing is, I was bringing into the data, actually, actually 
buy it. So don't get me onto this topic, but, but, but HR people bringing data um, to it as opposed to opinion is really valuable. Um, and so I would, that place my strength, I just bring loads of data and they, and they lap it up. Mm. That wasn't as a non-exec, that was, a, that was an exec role. Mm. Guy. I'm, I'm far too polite to ask any of you what your level of remuneration is and being <laughs> Not enough. Awards, but I'm, I'm actually interested in that as a, 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 an issue because quite clearly we know um, if you open the, the, the papers or you go online that there are more and more organisations now actually out recruiting and yeah. paying to non exec directs to come on to boards. And yeah. I'm mm. what your, your take is as HR professionals in advising yeah. those organisations of what the remuneration levels are. And also, for those of you who are on um, voluntary organisations, that whole debate that is around, around should um, non execs on voluntary organisations fall, particularly given the, sort of, uh, the shrinking sort of, um, uh, talent pool that exists out there. So, yeah. two yeah. questions, but both related yeah, okay. to the um, um, uh, well, um, Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, we won't ask you to. Uh, no, 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 uh, um, the, the typical going rate for an FT two fifty, uh, between thirty five and fifty. Um, uh, uh, probably doing about sort of ten, ten to sort of twenty days a year. That, that's not, now, the wise of a wide variance is as you've got your board meetings, you're, you're bound to be roped into some sort of committee, um, and the secretaries are all rubbish and they never put their committees on the same day as the board, so you end up having to come back and do that. Uh, and then you've got your usual getting to understand the organisation bit, which is wandering around and, and, and trying to get a feel for the place. So I reckon you should account for probably twice as much as they ever tell you uh, it, it is uh, going to be required. So I would always say things like, oh, it's, only, it's only six board meetings a year or whatever it is. I'm thinking that's a lie, you know, it's, it's going to be far more than that. So, so you have to probably double what they tell you. Uh, but 30, 35 to 50, I'd say, is the current rate for, for an FT250. Uh, chairman, phew, you're probably looking at 100. Uh, but there's a risk penalty. Uh, so if you're an FS, you, know, you can almost charge what you like because you know, it, you know, it could damage you if you get it, if you, if you mess up. Uh, charities pay absolute bugger all. Um, nothing, <laughs> nothing, in fact. Um, and and, and uh, there's a dis probably a big difficulty trying to do that. My, it's a really hard on my charity because you're there for a charitable end. Um, uh, and I'm not talking about guide dogs particularly, but my experience is, is that you know, I love the, the cause that they're trying to get to, is, you know, is, it's embedded in your heart, yeah. and, and you cry when you, when you um, realise how badly run they are, and thinking, if only you got paid a bit more cash and get some people that know what the bloody hell they're doing, um, because this is precious resource being wasted on stupid decisions. I'm not talking about guide dogs particularly, but I'm, 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 so please don't quote more adaptions. Um, um, but in my experience, when I talk to other charitable non execs, is, is that you need to, and I'm probably talking more exec pay here, is you need to pay to get some good people in that actually can contribute and, and, and help us meet those charitable loans. So it's absolutely zero for, for charities. Uh, and they will absorb, I was saying this earlier to Wendy, they, they will steal every minute of your day uh, if, if you allow them to. So I've just run two things for them. Um, had a bit of time, so I've just done a, a massive a, a compliance review in terms of how, how the board works, role of the non-exec, role of the exec, and um, that resulted in us appointing a new chairman. So I ran the search for the, uh, for the new chairman. So I'm very pleased we've, 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 we've now bagged one and uh, he's accepted. Uh, so I'll, yeah. I've done my good deeds, so I exit now and just be a normal non-exec. Um, pension funds uh, are now starting to pay. Uh, it's a good way of getting into being a non-exec, by the way. So any DB pension schemes uh, that you're aware of, um, they're moving much more now to uh, independence as opposed to sp uh, employer sponsor-led. Mm -hmm. So in the old days it used to just be stuffed full of the finance director, chief exec and various people. Uh, they're, they're, they're often now moving to independent boards and they're having to pay. Um, so mine at Nationwide is 10 grand. And that's uh, five five board meetings and one training day. Mm. I think the answer isn't anything between zero and 100k. <laughs> <laughs> Question over here. Yes, Mike. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Given the remuneration or lack of it, given the legal responsibility, certainly of financial services and the regulation responsibility, yeah. are there enough to go around? Enough people? Yeah, enough good nerves. Uh, no. Uh, I, I, think, I think you put your finger on it. It's, 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 you're almost stupid to go into FS. Um, 
you're going to get grilled. I tell you, those that aren't in FS, I'm sorry to keep to going back to it, but you're going to get you're going to go through the SIF interview with the FCA, yes. um, uh, the, the senior influence function. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, and they grill you. And people people are thinking, why am I doing this? Mm-hmm. Because you're going to get a bit of cash, but you know it's no way in there enough to get to cover reputational damage. So all you need is is you know one organisation to let's pick RBS for example. Who would have thought that RBS would have gone the way it did? Um, and I wonder what those non-execs on the board are doing now and, and how they're explaining their time at RBS. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I haven't tracked them, but mm-hmm. it's... Yeah, so, so the supplementary question is how do, how, when you're, you're obviously all on boards, how do your boards make it appealing? Yes, appealing um, to, for good people to be non-execs. Uh, I, I think the values, and I think Derek said it earlier, it's the values that the organisation espouses and do they match your values mm-hmm. and you do your due diligence. So you check uh, who the other non-exec directors are, their, their, their background, their pedigree. You check the chief exec. So you, 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 I absolutely advise you, you do not walk into that sort of thinking, oh, how marvellous, great name, I'll go and do it. Uh, you, you check all the people and make sure that you're, you're comfortable working with them. Um, and, and, I was, uh, and FS particularly. Uh, so I, I, I'll talk from real experience. When I was trying to find people for, for home serve, we were in enforcement. Um, uh, we, we picked up the biggest... Uh, uh, fine in personal financial services for a single item. Mm. Uh, we were stopped from selling. Um, you know, not a good place to be, and you're trying to pick up people to come onto your board, and and you, and, and you, you you look you get past the sort of you know with like a coffee and all the rest of it, and then it's like and you can see them looking at you thinking, mm, do I trust this guy? Uh, and I've spent a lot of time trying to trying to do exactly what you described, which is sell the organisation to these people. Yeah. Uh, I've got a few other thoughts as well. I completely agree with that. Um, the um, the way the way people construct their life changes. I think, at least it did for me. I reached a point where I decided I didn't want to work every day doing the same thing for one organisation. Um, so the kind of thing I do now suits me, and I, and I don't work every day. You know, I, I work in a pattern that suits the organisations. Um, but to expect someone to be available for half a dozen dates during the year, to arrange your holidays around that, um, to be available more often for slightly more informal things, and to do that for three or four other organisations juggling all of that, um, it really limits, I think, the choice that boards have then. So I won't name the organisation, but when I left the board, I said, I think we ought to try to replace me with someone who's got a full-time job, and someone who's younger. It just proves impossible to do that because perhaps people at that point in their life they can't devote the time or they can't get off for six days to go to board meetings or they would have to take it from their holiday or something. So I think, you know, if boards really wanted to broaden things out, um, they could perhaps think a little bit more about what, what are the impediments for some people in even contemplating doing this occasional kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd kind of add to that because I, I, I meet a lot of people who say, oh, I'd really love to be an ed. And actually, how do you get into it? So, are there enough people, good people? Yes. Is it back to that thing about how do you get to be an ed because you are an ed or because your chairman sponsors you or because you know the right people and, and so on and so and so on and so on? And I think as well, boards, you know, um, we, we were talking earlier, John and I were talking earlier about our, our kind of experiences with, with recruiters more broadly, is that th- th- there's a really risk averse mindset. People are recruiting in a ver- with a very specific list of tick, bo- tick boxy things. So, I think boards have to be, and I think the debate is starting or, or has started, you know, around diversity with Davis and the women on boards kind of thing, challenging boards to think more about the breadth of diversity, not just on the gender agenda as it were, but, you know, what is it to, that gives good board balance? Well, really, what would it be that would add value there and so on? And I think if boards do that kind of deep-seated kind of you know, your deep rooted rather kind of look at what what would really add value and spend the proper time recruiting people. I think there are people out there. I know loads of great people who would who would be you know fantastic. One of the things that I know that again for example as an example really um, sort of more forward thinking boards are doing they're saying look we want to change the balance on our boards but you know typically you'd have to have been an operational 
you know, director having run a big P&L account, doing blah, 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 that actually if we're trying to get a mix and see things differently, how do we do that? Let's split the portfolio, <coughs> let's give some development activity with, and so on and so on. So I think there's, a, there's that, that, that kind of thing on that. And I think the thing about the, the, the discussion about who would go into it is, you know, that's all about the individual's risk appetite, isn't it? And whether or not, that, mm. you know, you've done the proper conversation about what it's really like to work you know, as a or be a be a Ned. You know, both in terms of being upfront about the time commitments. You know, perhaps, perhaps the politics of the organisation, perhaps some of the business challenges. And I think you know those people that are attracted to that, the kind of turnaround basket case, will jump at the chance. <laughs> <laughs> and those people who are just not up for that, you know, will maybe mm. choose to go for something a little bit more steady. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, very good. Do we have uh, any recruiters in the room who'd like to comment <laughs> on? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on their experience perhaps of hiring for NEDs or the sort of conversations and discussions you have in relation to NEDs and maybe the search firms here looking over there or, or I'll, I'll make a more general yeah. comment which I think you know, yeah. all the panelists are saying um, is from my, so I'm, if you don't know I'm John Max at Aston owned and run Digby Morgan and sold it a few years ago but one thing that I always thought was interesting is that employees would always look for the security mm of finding someone that's done the same mm. job before. Mm. Mm. And, um, and I remember some searches where they said, yes, we'll look for someone outside of the legal sector or whatever sector mm. we're in. And eventually the shortlist was there, no, we need someone that knows our business. Mm. And I think that's mm. yeah. for, for, forever the case, the resistance mm. that you need to, to bring some change in. And I think you know, one of the reasons why um, NED's uh, or HR is, is, is poorly represented because they always think they've got to be a finance operation person. Mm -hmm. And you know, it comes back to the question I was asking, because all, all the, all the mm -hmm. questions and all the discussions are around finance and operations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's a challenge. I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's the way of the world. I'm pretty convinced. I, I think you're absolutely right, is, is that there's a tendency to have more finance people than anything else in the board. So if you look around how they've got ACA, for example, I would say probably the majority of the board have got ACA. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, looking now, the debate is, and in the old days, the debate was much, you, know, you probably spent most of the board meeting just talking about your P&L and the balance sheet and those sorts of things. But my experience, in, having sat in attendance in, in boards, is that, yeah, that's there. But actually, you know, it's, it's not dominating the board now. Um, so first of all, it was risk coming in, uh, in various forms. So, so you know, risk directors now being appointed and talking. And, and now it's, 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 it's moving into, okay, do we have the capability in the organisation? And it is about people. And I think some boards are struggling because you look around, well, who's going to talk to this? Yeah. So then you find that then I'm in attendance at the board. Um, so I think, I think it's not a big jump then to, real, to, to get to H, someone with HR background. Yeah. The way probably in, is uh, in through REM, I think. Uh, that's probably what chief execs want or the chairman wants, is yeah. someone that can, well, if I take someone in, uh, with HR, they can be the chair of REM, yeah. REM committee as well. So yeah. they're, they're thinking about, you know, it's process. But then uh, that's mm. not such a bad thing to go in on a REM basis. It mm. can be quite fun. Good. Um, question over here. <laughs> My question is a practical question. Um, having been a HR director and now running my own business for the last three years, I'm finding that I'm working with HRDs that brought into businesses to help get those HRDs board fit. Mm -hmm. So I'm the other end of it. I'm kind of helping them, or I'm writing the papers that they're delivering, or I'm helping recruit in nets. And I personally, as, as part of my next career move, would like to get to become a NED, but I'm kind of thinking, how would I become a NED if I'm not working with the chair and the board? Yeah. So yeah. my question is, is really, is there a NED um, network? Is there a NED in terms of mentors that I can yeah. work with? Yeah. From a practical perspective, that's really what I'm looking for. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, <laughs> uh, the IOD run a fantastic program uh, for new NEDs. Um, and it also comes with a network as well and also coaching. But those that want to look at uh, perhaps earlier on, uh, there's a thing called uh, Whitehall and Industry Group. Yes. Um, very good. They also run a, um, a new NED program. And once you're on their database, you're then bombarded with probably all, all um, uh, government and sort of non neo government type uh, appointments. There, there are just hundreds. I, I'm on their database. You're thinking, bloody hell, I mean, NEDs are there. But you know, there's like for every conceivable thing, there's a. Um, so, so if you want uh, uh, um, to get into being the first one, and, and by the way, 
I took the guide dogs on, not because I wanted to become just a net, but I, I do genuinely believe and, mm. and like the cause and want to help them. Yeah. But it was a fantastic, it's, it's an £80 million pound turnover business mm. and 1,400 staff, so it's a big, big business. Um, and that was the way, that, so I thought, yeah, I'll do that because I, think, a, I can contribute mm. something genuinely. It's a passion I love. Um, and I can, I can come away with some, some skills. Mm. Um, so I'd say you look at WIG uh, if you want to get into sort of a government type thing. Um, and of course. Uh, yeah, again, I think, you know, to the point to Guy's question, you know, is it paid or isn't it paid? And um, to the point that would be made about the time, for me, um, I mean, when I've been, I've been talking to um, fellow HR directors who are, who are NES, a, a, a fantastic example of a lady that I was speaking to who happens to live locally to this um, arts organisation and just kind of thought, oh, I'd love to get involved in that and popped in to speak to them and then was appointed to the board as a result. And, I, and for me, the things that I'm, I'm the, where I'm spending my, because I've got a full-time job as well and I do other stuff, you know, and uh, uh, as well, you know, you have to be, you have to choose things that you are genuinely interested in. And if if you think about and just do a bit of things about mapping that and you know are you prepared to do some of that unpaid then I think you'll find the thing that will be your lead in because you know and, and particularly on the, the kind of charities and and trustees things there's there's um there's a really good organisation, and I can't remember the name of it, but I think it's something like Reach. But if you just do a Google search of, mm -hmm. you know, positions on that, and basically they advertise trustee vacancies, and you can go in and search for according to your, you know, what you're interested in. Are you interested in victim support? Are you interested in children? What have you? And you can specify down to the local area. And so there's lo there's loads of opportunities out there. Um, I think most net positions are still done through networking. So just stick mm -hmm. it on LinkedIn and go and talk to people and make sure every Everybody yeah. knows you want to do it. I'm going to ask Kay to chip in because yeah. Kay is actually on the board of London HR Connection and by chance runs a networking group for NEDS. <laughs> <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> It's the white hole industry group that we just yeah. 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 yeah, it's the white hole industry group. You're quite right in saying there's two ways that you can approach it. Um, so you could go down the SME route, work with sort of startups, because that's that, that gives you that sort of um, experience to be able to say. Um, I, I know there's some, um, you know, like you get funding <coughs> companies, companies that fund SMEs, um, that might be a route to go down. Um, and as you say, with the, the, the um, there's a, a non-executive directors network. So you might want to get involved in that. And they do charge to be a part of it. If you can get someone to sponsor you, just to say, you know, um, you're pretty good at what you do and what value you add. That's that's another good way. And um, I found um, there's also FT Financial Times. If you look at Financial Times, they do a diploma. And my, my best advice in that area would be if you can speak to your organisation, perhaps your CEO, and say to them, look, you know, I'm looking at developing my own skills. It costs about five grand. I know people who've been on that event and perhaps got it sponsored by their organisation. Some have paid out through their own pocket. And um, once you get that accreditation, it really it shows that you're serious about taking that route of becoming a non-exec. So when you are approaching companies, you can say that you've, you know, you've gone down the whole sort of compliance understanding about risk. So rather than just turning up to an interview and saying, you know, I'd love to be an ed, um, you can say, look, I've been serious about it and I've, you know, I've got, I've got the accreditation. It's sponsored by Santander, who sponsored FT. Um, and they have a network as well, which you can get part of. But it will cost you a bit of money. I would say if you're really ser serious about it, you, you will invest in it. Um, but if it's just like, you know, um, taking a gamble at it, then, then you need to work your networks. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, question back. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'm Dolphin Tato, I work at Chapman CG, which is a, actually a global HR search firm. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I've got a 21-year search experience in the industry. Um, I just wanted to add, You can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Curious to know what that is. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
strategy and counter strategy, they'll often take a really balanced view. They've often got um, external interests that they voice during a you know interview with a chat with me. They might be charitable interests or sitting on the school board or whatever it is, but they might often have actually been an HRD and then been a COO and then gone back to an HRD job. So they might have worked in a big bank and <coughs> moved to a medium-sized enterprise, um, gone up the value chain, found that they're rubbing shoulders with CAOs, COOs, CIOs, and then actually moved into that space and moved back again. Um, so to your point, gentlemen on the left, um, quite often they would have done something broader already during their HR career. Um, they usually really <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I think it's just sort of part of the makeup of the individual who makes a good ADD coming through the HR group. Okay. Thank, thank you, Donna. Uh, question here? Craig, question for you. Okay. You, you've been an interim. He has an interim. Uh, you're not into negotiations about how much of your holiday entitlement you're going to be using because you haven't got any. Um, so uh, I, I find practically and content wise huge advantages. <coughs> I think they might also, if I could just add, I know you asked Craig, but um, the independence that you have as a non-exec is a double-edged thing because people don't tell you what you should be doing with your time. You know how much you're going to devote to it, but, but you're going to decide what you focus on. And, and Craig's got the interim experience, not me, but I know that is what you want in an interim. You know, some, they're not going to be here forever. You, you wanna, you're going to get from here to here, and you've got X months to do it. And it does feel a little bit like that as a non-exec. You know, mine is about 20 days a year. So four years, 20 days a year, 80 days. You know, mm. whether it could be 160, I know it could be more than that, but you know, that's what, that's, you kind of allocate that and think, well, I spend a day on that, possibly it's a day I can't spend on this. Mm. I, I was thinking, I guess, as an interim, you have to get into things very, very quickly. You do, You don't yeah. have that yeah. learning curve, you don't. Yeah. And, and also that, that, that sort of, you know, you were talking about Sometimes it's that uh, transition from not taking over and wanting to do things, being a bit more consultative mm. and, and, and listening and, and asking all those yeah. questions, which yeah. you have yeah. to do as an interim yeah. if you're going to deliver in you a do. short period of yeah. time. Mm. So, uh, you know, I wondered if it was a skill that when um, boards are looking, that that's something saleable, if you like, that's something that would be interesting for them. I would have thought so, but I'm probably biased. But yeah. <laughs> I think you're being brought in as an interim anyway, because. Mm. <coughs> of a lack of skill internally. Uh, it's kind of the same story for a non-exec. Really. And so, you know, you, if you can open up your network to the organisation, it's one of the best things you can do. I mean, there's quite often an organisation hits a point, can't go beyond it, beyond it. But your external, different experience might allow you to go beyond that. We've probably got, I think there's a question over here. Yeah? Just a quick one. When you're talking about going off the transition, when you went from HRD to net, what challenges did you come across that you really hadn't anticipated? In other words, everyone who obviously wants to become a nerd and go to an NFL has an expectation of what it would be like. How does that differ now that you're actually in a role from the expectation you had? Mm. I thought boards were really clever <laughs> <laughs> and they're not they're human yeah. and they have all the foibles that execs have but they just have a carry a different badge yeah. uh, I think once you get past you get over yourself and realize that actually you know, you've got you know you might be wrong um, that's the biggest learning curve uh, and and I think some I've met some fantastic nets uh, and I really feel that I've got to know them really well uh, and enjoy being with them and I'm learning a lot um, from just um, listening to their contribution to the board and that makes me a better HRD um, so that's my big thing but they're normal people they're not they're these you know you, we hold them up in this huge regard they're not I think for me there's probably two things um, one I think I learned from observing boards before and it's exactly to the point that has been made about the difference between an exec and a non-exec because I had experience working with boards where the chairman had been appointed and thought he was going to be the chief executive and um, you know when you see that the really the, the boards that operate really well they absolutely understand that distinction so they they're both supportive of the executive team they don't micromanage they um, they are, they enable mm. but they but mm. when the chips are down they can't let an issue go if they need to chase it through and I think those things I learned from observing really good balls in action so and and tried to apply that then when I was when I was made a non-exec and um, I like 
owning stuff, which is why I'm, I've still got a day job as an exec director. Um, and um, but it's a really different mindset when you're going to a board as a non-exec director. You've been appointed for a reason. Uh, you you have responsibilities, but kind of at the end of the day, when you walk away, you've made your points. You hope that people have listened to them, otherwise you wouldn't bother turning out right. Um, but um, it is not your decision in the same way whether or not it kind of gets acted on, unless there's an issue of governance or something like that that you were worried about. So I think if you, that transition, it, I, I did that transition of mindset before I joined a non-exec director board. If I hadn't have, because I'd observed good balls in action and because I knew that I wanted to do that. Plus also, because I've got a day job where I am busy as, a, as an exec, I don't feel like I want to dabble. And actually it's quite a relief in a nice way <laughs> when you leave a busy board meeting and you go actually you know you now you can make it so because that's not my responsibility I think the other thing that um, that's the, the point that's been made as well and I've again chosen my um, uh, non-exec positions because of this kind of time commitments and I knew that I could sort of work around it but you have to be prepared to do the reading you have to be prepared to carve that time out to you know, get enough, get your head in the, you know, that organisation's business before you go into the meetings, and to kind of, you know, to not go into the minutiae of the paper, but say, what are the three things here that I think they need to be thinking about that they might not? Have? Do you know what I mean? So you have to have that time, on, uh, you know, to spend on that. Good. Thank, thank, thanks for that, Derek. Uh, and just two, two um, small things, right? Uh, um, uh, that are a bit more um, about. Uh, you the person so be clear why you're doing it in the first place you know what is it you want to get out of it um, and try to make sure you do get that whatever it is and then when you think you've reached the point where your contribution you can't you can't make a new contribution you're in danger of repeating yourself um, then uh, I think the right thing to do then is to make way and let somebody else come along and have, have a have a different attempt at something um, and quite often, uh, non-exact appointments are fixed term anyway. Mm. So you, you've got the benefit of not needing to think about resigning because you're, <laughs> you're going to get resigned automatically when you reach the end of something. So that helps focus things as well. Mm. Good. Um, we probably have time for one last quick question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you're going to first with a hand up. So. Oh, is it nobody else? No. All oh, right. Okay. So my, my question is really, so we're having this conversation today about um, HRD being on board. Um, HR work very closely um, with the exec team. Would that not be able to drive the agenda to see that diversity um, with the chairman perhaps, you know, understanding why perhaps they're not there? So rather than kind of going it from a different angle is, is going back to the business and questioning the business, you know, what, why do we not have HIV? So my, my take is on, to get your opinion yeah. around why are HR not driving that agenda to the chairman or the board? Um, I, it's, it's, a good, it's a really good question because um, I guess the bit I didn't when I became HR director in 1854, um, <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't. I thought I was working for the chief exec, and I thought how, how naive was that in the end? Because I hadn't realised actually um, how much time the chairman actually wanted, and I just had never appreciated that. Um, and, and, I, and then I guess in hindsight, I think it's, it's, it's a hard job being chairman, isn't it? Because you know, you're, you're trying to get a sense of where the truth of the organisation is. So who do you turn to? Well, the chief exec has an agenda and will we'll, we'll buy us things the way the chief exec wants. Um, so who, do, who does the chief exec, who does the chairman talk to? Um, so I, I found myself spending probably as much time, in some cases actually probably more time, talking to the chairman than I did the chief exec. And that's hard actually because you're employed by the chief exec um, and you're representing them. Um, but the, the bit I think is a practical point of why HR people have struggled to get onto boards is they, in my experience, they, want, they do want smaller boards, and, unless it's a representative type mm. of board, I understand that the, the distinction. Uh, they, they want a tight board. They know, and then spaces are, are, are sort of already filled because they know they have to have somebody with a finance background. They know they probably have something with a core product that the thing you're selling. So there are very few seats left if they want to have a small board. And then you've got an issue around sort of balance of boards as well in terms of how many execs versus non-execs you've got. So suddenly the space for a HR person is, you know, you're competing with 
other things. But, my, but I'm, I'm convinced with all the conversation I have with different chairmen is, is that they do want someone to talk to that sort of broad cultural piece around uh, is a culture a, a, a disabler to the organisation achieving what it wants to achieve. And no one around that room currently is able to talk to that. Marketing might have a bit of a go, but uh, they often run out of, and they talk about products and pricing all the time. Uh, but no one talks about about sort of um, the people and actually, do you have the capability in the organisation to deliver this thing that you're talking about? So I, I'm, I am genuinely convinced that, that our moment is, is if it's not here now, it's, it's we are very close to it, is that the, the boards will want it. I suspect that they'll, I'll go back to my point earlier, they'll come at it from a tactical position, which is let's go for someone with REM experience or whatever it might be, because that's how boards think, in my experience. Good. Uh, thank you for that. I think in the interest of time, we'll bring things to a close. So, um, any closing remarks, Wendy? Any uh, any closing remarks from you? Uh, so, I think, you know, um, the question was, um, do HR directors make good NEDs? And uh, I'll just kind of summarise the conversation that we had in the bar earlier, which is, if they're a good HR director, they'll make a good NED. And I genuinely believe that. And I think we've got to seize mm. the people agenda a little bit more. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Derek, anything? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and um, I suppose I'd say keep attending events like this, but also make sure you attend events like Institute of Directors, mm. um, some Chamber of Commerce. So to, even if your work doesn't broaden your experience, that you at least broaden your network. Uh, 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 four questions to ask yourself. Um, do I have something to contribute uh, to the board? Am I capable of, of uh, passing judgment on the company's management strategic plan and the risks? And are you prepared to speak up? Uh, do I have sufficient time? Because it, it will take more time than they ever say, believe me. Uh, and uh, am I aware of the risks? Mm. Uh, and if you tick all those boxes and say yes, 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 then start really early because it takes a long time. And, and don't, be, don't be fussy. Um, don't pick, you know, I want to be on an ed for that particular organisation or that sector because you may be chasing something you'll never get. So be prepared to um, 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 go off, off, off target um, and get the first one. And believe me, once you get the first one, you, your LinkedIn won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So um, on that note, I'd like to thank all of the panellists today. I think we've had a really fascinating debate. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. I'd like to give uh, the panel a round of applause. <laughs> And uh, I hope you will uh, stay with us for a glass of wine and food or a bit of both. Um, hopefully the panel will be around as well for a little bit longer to enjoy the hospitality. Um, just a couple of things in closing. We have one further final event for 2015 uh, coming up on the 2nd of November in the evening. 2nd of December, I should say. God, where does the time go? Um, we have uh, a very senior speaker, actually, uh, Mike Elwood, who is the MD for Corporate Services for Santander. Um, and uh, obviously he's doing a very big job for the bank. Um, he is going to be talking about managing change in um, financial services, mm. but he assures us that there are learnings for all sectors, so don't just come along if you're in FS, it's uh, learnings for everybody. That's on the evening of the 2nd of December. Um, and hopefully come along. Also to say, those of you here tonight as guests, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you'll come to further sessions. I hope you'll consider joining London HR Connection. Uh, if you would like any further information about it, please do speak to me, or Kay, or Guy, or Fraser, or Denise, or uh, probably all the board members here. Um, so, uh, welcome, thanks for coming along, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.